You're listening to Sound Money from Casey Research. Hello and welcome to the show with me, your host, Andy Duncan, coming to you from London. My guest today is Paul Chesney, the co-founder and chief technology officer of Coin Trader Exchange, and he's coming to us from Vancouver. Today, we'll be talking about Bitcoin, the criticisms against it, and how it compares to gold and other hard monies. Hello, Paul. Hi, Andy. Great to be here. Great to have you with us. Now, believers in sound money have uh, long held gold and silver to be the best private monies, particularly coming from the the Austrian school kind of things. But many libertarians are now proclaiming and evangelizing Bitcoin. What do you think makes Bitcoin better than, say, gold? Well, I think Bitcoin has certain properties that uh, are lacking in gold that makes it attractive to libertarians. And I think one of the often criticisms I hear against Bitcoin is that it has no physical form. And while that is a limitation of sorts, it's also one of its, one of its chief advantages in that it can be moved frictionlessly across the world, uh, but can also maintain uh, scarcity. So I think that the fact that it is a digital commodity of sorts uh, gives it a, a special um, advantage over gold. And this also comes into play into things like confiscation. It makes confiscation much more difficult uh, when you don't have a physical, tangible item. Now, some people you probably know, like uh, Peter Schiff, uh, the reason they don't like Bitcoin is because it doesn't, it didn't have any market value before it became a money. So if we look at the von Mises regression theory or the Menger regression theory from the Austrian school, they say that monies must come out of something which had a previous market value. What do you think of this prior market value criticism? Well, I think before Bitcoin was considered money, it actually sort of traded in the uh, the gaming world. So people used it as tokens uh, in games like Magic the Gathering. And there's also the first ever Bitcoin transaction, which was two pizzas for 10,000 Bitcoins. So you might actually consider that as uh, its original sort of uh, place in a barter system. So we can consider it as sort of a game, uh, a game currency or a game sort of commodity. And uh, then it turns into sort of a, a means of exchange later on. But early on, it practically had no value in terms of real world uh, monetary. I love that, uh, the idea of a pizza costing $25,000 now. Now, are you uh, one of these people who's just pure Bitcoin? So you see in 20 years' time, they're just being Bitcoin. Or do you think in the future, there'll be any kind of role for gold and silver and other uh, more traditional hard monies? Absolutely. Um, Actually, we... I I see actually a lot of different types of digital currencies coming along. Uh, There are interesting developments for uh, some technology such as uh, open transactions, which will allow people to issue digital currencies that are backed by uh, physical items like gold, silver. Uh, Actually, there's a, a local guy here in BC who runs the Sovereign Silver Exchange. And he has, for many years, already operated a digital silver uh, currency, but it is sort of held within a centralized system. And some of these new technologies will allow him to issue sort of silver certificates digitally that can be exchanged without having to go through him as a central uh, verifier of the transactions. Yeah, now we've also seen some resistance to Bitcoin by governments and uh, central banks of various forms. So we've seen some resistance in China and Russia. And we've also seen the IRS in the United States decide to tax Bitcoin as a property upon which capital gains can be taxed rather than uh, have it as a currency. Do you think that this government opposition to Bitcoin is going to stop it and possibly kill it? Or do you think that this sort of opposition is just irrelevant? I think the opposition is irrelevant. And I think it's... I actually find it an encouraging sign that it's it's making an impact and it's a it's something that concerns the central authorities. So they I think they still have yet to actually wrap their heads around what they're dealing with. And even even if say Bitcoin was somehow uh, destroyed or um, demolished, it can boot back up. It's an open source piece of software. It's it's like file sharing. 
I don't see any reasonable or realistic way for any government to try and shut down Bitcoin without uh, shutting down the entire internet. So it'd be a bit like uh, Mickey Mouse trying to shut down the uh, the mops on the buckets in the the cartoon. Absolutely, that's a great analogy. Now, uh, another group who might be getting a bit scared of Bitcoin, not not the central banks and the governments who go very, very slowly, but the actual commercial banks, I mean, they see this one network across which you can transfer um, unlimited amounts of money uh, in a costless way, rather than going through 17 different clearing banks who all take a, a piece of the action on the way. They must be starting to get terrified of Bitcoin. Do you think commercial banks are going to try to put com uh, pressure on governments to try to kill Bitcoin off? And, and if so, do you think that they could have a bit more success than just central banks putting in a few measures? Yes, I think there is very good reason for, for banks and also um, credit card companies, uh, anyone that's in the remittance business to be worried or see Bitcoin and Bitcoin related technologies as a threat. Uh, recently, UBS Bank out of Switzerland put out a report where they mention uh, Bitcoin technology as something that uh, financial institutions need to adopt, not necessarily Bitcoin itself, but they need to come up with something similar. And I, I think that this is very healthy uh, because the banking system has been insulated from competition for a long time. So I have, I have no doubt that they will maybe try to develop something similar or technologies to make themselves more efficient. Um, so, and banks do hold a lot of sway with governments. They have uh, lobbyists and a lot of power to move the political discourse. But again, I think uh, their power is limited um, because if their main instrument is the government, they're limited by what the government can do to Bitcoin. And as I mentioned before, I don't think that any of those means can be uh, very effective. Okay, as devil's advocate then, I'm going to throw you another one based upon what you've just said. Now, some real hardcore conspiracy theorists have said that Satoshi Nakamoto, the supposed creator of Bitcoin, is actually the NSA in disguise, and that Bitcoin itself is just a kind of super global government attempt to create one world global money. Um, what do you think of this idea? Um, I, I suppose it's, it's possible, although I don't think it's a very uh, effective method of imposing a <laughs> worldwide centralized uh, currency, because in the event that this comes out or, you know, everything in the Bitcoin network is transparent. So there's, if Bitcoin fails or if Bitcoin is something that is uh, controlled by a small group uh, against the uh, the greater population. There's nothing stopping everybody else from taking the Bitcoin technology, rebooting it, changing some of the algorithm, and coming up with a completely new currency that is outside of that. There's already a hundred competing currencies with Bitcoin, and it's very easy to switch from one to the other. Being more practical, there was the recent Mt. Gox collapse and a lot of people lost their faith a little bit in Bitcoin when that happened. Uh, do you think that was a one-off and do you think everything's going to be a lot safer from now? Uh, and how are people going to get their faith back in Bitcoin? Yeah, I, I think there's been, uh, I mean, Mt. Gox was not the first time there's been uh, a crash of this kind or a theft. There's been many throughout the history of Bitcoin. And I think what's what's really interesting, um, the first time uh, Mt. Gox had a security issue, uh, back in 2011, uh, the price dropped from $33 to practically zero. And at that time, uh, it was much more unstable. And even, even myself thought that maybe this is the end of Bitcoin experiment. Uh, and it actually quickly rallied back to $5 and kept growing. So these types of crashes and breaches are, are not new. So that gives me a little bit of uh, confidence. But it does, it does take the wind out of the sails for a period of time. And I don't think that we're out of the water. It's still a very young technology. And there's a lot of companies that uh, don't follow best practices. Uh, there isn't a lot of uh, auditing or self or sort of a private uh, regulation going on. But I think that's increasing and that's getting better. And over time, these sorts of things will be minimized. 
And, and how long do you think it will be then before what you might call the ordinary person in the street is, is happy with Bitcoin? It seems to be very much a kind of geeky libertarian thing at the moment. When will my mother uh, be buying ice creams with Bitcoin? You know, it's funny. I think it's it's beginning to enter that phase. Um, I've been working with uh, the Bitcoiniacs for the past six months or so, and we've had all sorts of people come and start using Bitcoin. We've seen grandmothers, we've seen children come in of eight or nine years old with their parents who have asked to have their allowance in Bitcoin. So I, we're seeing people from all all over the the spectrum, people that aren't really technologically savvy, but are interested and curious. So I think that's beginning to take place. It's still not, not there, but at least uh, it's in the psychology of the population. So whereas maybe a year ago, hardly anybody you would talk to on the street would even know what Bitcoin is. Now it's, it's almost uh, totally uh, in the minds of everybody in some form or another, whether they own Bitcoin or not. So it's uh, it's getting easier, but I'm not sure. It's uh, they say it takes about ten years before a, a new technology uh, sort of penetrates uh, the market, and we've we've got about five years to go. So that might give you some approximation. Well, if it makes you feel better, my mother has heard of Bitcoin now, which uh, which was a shock to me when I mentioned it to her. Now, just a final <laughs> question: Bitcoin is currently trading, I think, at around five hundred fiat paper dollars per Bitcoin. What do you think that's going to be in a year? I'm not going to hold you to this. Just what's your best guess? And after your five-year period, when you've had 10 years of the technology, what do you think the dollar price for one Bitcoin will be in five years' time? Oh, I hate these types of questions. Um, <laughs> but uh, if, I, if I had to do a wild guess and take sort of the short lifespan of Bitcoin that I've seen so far, uh, I'd probably estimate the price of Bitcoin a year from now to be somewhere between two and five thousand dollars, and in five years from now, uh, assuming the, the the project continues to succeed and is not replaced by some other technology, um, I could probably imagine the the price of Bitcoin sitting somewhere around a hundred thousand fiat dollars per Bitcoin. And with the caveat that this is also relative to the value of fiat dollars, which, um, as I'm sure a lot of your listeners know, can be very flexible. Yeah, it could be $100,000 <laughs> for one ice cream, couldn't it? That's right. Well, it's been great uh, speaking with you tonight, Paul. How can our listeners find out more about your Cointrader exchange? Uh, they can visit Cointrader.net. And on there, we have uh, a lot of videos that people can see. They have beginner, intermediate, and advanced videos. And as well, you can get your first Bitcoins there fairly easily. So that's probably a great place for people to start. Fantastic. Thank you for your time today, Paul Chesney. Thank you. Good to be here. You can subscribe to Sound Money on iTunes or sign up to our subscription service at soundmoneyshow.com, where you can also listen to our wide catalogue of podcasts. These include interviews with some of the most famous speakers on money in the world. These include Jim Rogers, Doug Casey, Rick Rule, and Mark Farber. A special thank you today for Paul Chesney for joining us on the show, and thank you too for listening. Until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.